Welcome to School Talk. I'm Nadja Varney, your host. There's a new federal law, an education federal law. It goes by ESSA, and that stands for Every Student Succeeds Act. Do you know how it's going to impact you, your children, your schools, or your community? There are some important changes. Let's talk about it. I'm so happy today to welcome as my guest Dr. Lisa Battolino. She's currently the Dean of the College of Education and Allied Studies at Bridgewater State University. Welcome, Dr. Battolino. Thank you so much for having me. Well, it's, it's been a while. You've been on this show. I was looking back, and you were on. Every time some new major thing came up, I would call on you, whether it was special ed or new teacher training. So thank you for being so faithful to coming back on again. Oh, it's my pleasure. Well, you're welcome. Happy to have you here. Um, actually, before we start on the topic, I hope you won't mind, but just very briefly, what drew you into higher ed education? You've been in so many parts of it. Now you're a, d a dean. And I wonder not only what drew you in, but what motivates you to stay? People never stay. Well, <laughs> my, the, the big um, draw for me was certainly I wanted to be a teacher as a young person. I actually have a brother with a disability. So I was very interested in special education, and I became a special ed teacher and loved it. Uh, and then I was working to further my education. I got my master's degree and my doctorate, and that led me into teaching at the college level, which I also loved, and became a professor of special education for other teachers hoping to become special ed teachers. I then sort of fell into the role of the chairperson of that department, That's right, and that are. kind of led me into being a dean. But still, my passion is really um, primarily with teaching, although I have lots of other departments in the College of Education and Allied Studies. We have athletic training, we have movement arts, we have communication disorders. But my real focus and passion for life is in preparing people to be the best kinds of teachers they can be and to work with children and to really improve our society through that route. Well, I can see your passion is still there and that is great, especially today, just a little side note here, because I see so many places now where they think you can just get a college graduate and give them five or six weeks training, like Teach for America or something, and put them into a classroom with no understanding of child development or the process of learning. So I'm so glad that you're still passionate about getting professionals ready for the classroom. Well, talking about this new law now, no child left behind is gone. And you know there, was pl there were plenty of complaints about all the testing, and they took time away from arts and music, phys ed, even kindergarten children or first graders, they were missing recess. So now here we are, um, a new day, and people were very afraid of being labeled, so I don't know what you're going to say about that in this talk, but people were so afraid of having their schools labeled as failing and then getting punished by it. So overall, I know there's so many parts to this new federal law, and people are still talking about it. But overall, how is it basically different from No Child Left Behind? Well, some of the um, differences, first of all, it really is an effort to upgrade and to improve No Child Left Behind. Oh. So it isn't completely reinventing the wheel. It's an effort for the federal government and the president to say, this is the weaknesses with our uh, program before with No Child Left Behind, and these are some of the remedies we think that will improve it uh, and serve children better. So the focus, unfortunately, I don't see the focus totally eliminating evaluation. And one of the, this is a good thing, and kind of all of these improvements have pluses and minuses. Mm -hmm. One of the uh, focuses certainly on the new uh, legislation is on in fact, additional teacher evaluation. And it really specifies how we want to do that. And I firmly believe that teachers at this point are over-evaluated. They're not evaluated on a teacher-by-teacher -teacher basis either. It's really um, incumbent upon the administrators to evaluate the teachers, also putting a burden on the administrators. So we really have, that, that's part of the focus. So teacher evaluation is a great thing. We have to have it. Teachers need to be accountable. On the other hand, I think it's gotten to a point where it is really not as effective as it should be and really cumbersome for both administrators and teachers. I wonder, listening to that, um, I'm just wondering if are we still going to be have teachers evaluated by students' test scores? Um, that focus isn't um, direct. 
but that's certainly something we are looking at, and it seems to be a direction that people are going on. Part of the teacher evaluation system does involve teachers doing a self-assessment, so I think that's the place where it's interesting and important for teachers to look at how are my students progressing from their, the teacher perspective. Well, see, um, Dr. Badalino, you know, I've ta I taught for 30, over 30 years, and from way back, we had criterion refer reference tests, we had end-of-book tests, we had standardized metropolitans. So the whole idea of testing was never anathema to teachers. We always thought we have to know where the kids are. Of course. But this whole idea of the, t the test scores, when you look into a classroom, you see some children who are privileged and have every background and they're advanced, and then go into a rural poverty area, and to say the teachers have to be evaluated on the test scores of various children coming from such different backgrounds, and then go, well, you've taught in high school, you'll see some kids sitting there, there I'm here because my mother made me come, and his test score is now going to be evaluating the teacher. Well, that's a very interesting point you bring up, because that's the other thing about testing children in school. Everything that the children produce in terms of test scores is not, everything is not dependent on how well or how hard the teacher worked to produce, uh, or to create interesting classes, to produce interesting lessons, to teach the children. Lots of it is, but not everything. A lot of other factors come into play when we look at children's performances on exams, and actually their performance in school in general. A lot of things such as the community, the um, socioeconomic income of the children, mm -hmm. the first language of the child, mm -hmm. all of those things are important factors too. So. Child, um, the child's test scores are certainly not the only factor that determine how well the teacher is doing. In mm -hmm. fact, it's only a small indicator of how well the teacher is doing. In addition, a lot of schools place the most difficult or most challenging children with the best teachers. I was about to tell you that because that's what happened. When I was a resource and um, head teacher and went back to the classroom, you know how schools change, and of course, I had children who were at the bottom of the scale, if you want to put it that way, should have stayed in a kindergarten, and then others who could read at fifth grade level, all in the same second grade. So all those things, people outside of our profession don't understand that. They want to see it as a business. We put this in, measure, and let's see how they're doing. That kind of accountability. I hope it's not so uh, as stringent as it was in No Child Left Behind. I think it's still pretty stringent, to be honest with you. Really? And I think that teachers are being evaluated on so many issues, and being, and rather than being encouraged to be evaluated and observed by peers, mm -hmm. other teachers, who can really give meaningful feedback and mm -hmm. observations, Absolutely. they're being uh, given a series of outcomes. It's good to have outcomes, I approve of that, but to have to perform on all of these different areas, document them all, have it evaluated by administrators is a, a tough burden on the administrators and also um, may not be the most effective way to really analyze how well a teacher is doing. We, we talk so much about, you know, having effective, you know, an adequate uh, evaluation of, of anything that we do. And yet, when teachers have no voice in it, and it comes from somewhere up in the clouds, uh, but people who are not in the trenches, so to speak, uh, quote, not quote the trenches, but people who know what's going on in the classroom, they seem to have no voice. In fact, I actually had a friend who taught for, oh, 15 years or more, and she said, Nadja, she said, I have to t um, take the script, and I have to read it to my whole second grade, teach them as a class. And this was a very creative, wonderful woman. And she said, I sabotage. In the afternoon, I break them up because I know that some of them don't know what I'm talking about and others are so advanced. But this, is the, this kind of bringing in a business model seems to me the wrong way to do it. You can t tell somebody how to do a particular form in a business, but with children, they're not little robots. So anyway, uh, this whole prescription and evaluation thing is not going to be over, I'm sure. They'll be hearing from many people. But with, can you tell me a little more now? We talked about the teacher testing for this new law that Every Child Succeeds Act. 
you spoke about the teacher testing and evaluation, and we got into the student. Is there another portion that you'd like to mention? Because there's, well, there's so many there's parts. Several, there's several things that are really uh, great about the ESSA. One is the No Child Left Behind really had almost an exclusive focus on English language arts and on math and science. That was really the focus of that legislation. Whereas this legislation says we really want to address and, and create innovative programs and uh, lessons and, and schools for all, all subjects. So it opens up an ability to have programs where we didn't have that focus before in areas such as music, art, uh, uh, any of the specials, physical education. And I, I really applaud the president's effort to include that into the new legislation. The other thing that I, I, I don't know if I mentioned it before, but the focus on college readiness is very important. I think um, you and I talked a little earlier about dropout rates. Dropout rates, fortunately, are going down. That means we want college rates to go up. We would like to see more students coming to college. So this law now does address how do we get students ready for success at the college level. And that's an exciting aspect of the new legislation. Yeah, and in fact, I'm happy to hear you say that there's more emphasis on the arts and other parts of learning and growing. But I'm just hoping that they allow very creative teachers to integrate those things and not say, time for art, take out your pencils and your crayons, but how to integrate art with something like project-based learning. Dr. Okers has been on my show and discussed it. And there, the test scores for people using project-based learning, which we can do another show on later, but the, the test scores are just as good as, as other kind of more prescriptive, follow the book type of teaching. I agree with you completely. And I think really integrated type of learning, even for the basic subjects of English language arts, science, uh, mathematics, integrating those together into interesting, uh, current, fascinating lessons, that's the way we really should teach. We don't have to uh, uh, just teach math for an hour a day. We really can be teaching Absolutely. fascinating mathematics while we're talking about social studies or music or mm -hmm. art or any of the other subjects. So really integrating all of these things into um, stimulating lessons for all learners, that's the way to go. You mentioned college readiness and getting more people to go to college. So we're going to have to go to a break. But when we come back, let's talk about how are we doing that? We'll be right back. Stay with us. Michael Adams. Here. Michael Adams. Here. Michael Adams. Students who miss 18 days of school in any grade risk falling behind and not graduating. Absences add up. Dr. Badalino, we've been talking about the testing and seeing how students can be excited. And now they're talking more and more, I think you said, about getting more people to go to college because we're lowering the dropout rates and graduation rates are going up. Um, what did you call that, college readiness? And what's happening in that regard? Well, we certainly want to get people ready for college. And we want the students that are coming to us, that are accepted to us, our college to come here and sort of hit the ground running. A lot of times students aren't completely prepared in terms of reading and mathematics uh, and writing. I shouldn't say reading. I, I, in, in terms of writing skills and mathematics skills, sometimes they aren't, uh, don't have the exact skill set that they need to begin in college level courses. So we have to sometimes give them prep classes and that type of thing. So we want to improve that in public schools, certainly. We want the focus to really be on having them leave high school and be ready to enter college. Or, at the very least, come to us and then we can get them ready. So that is a bit of a focus um, in, on those two regards. But in terms of getting uh, this addressing college readiness, one thing that's wonderful is that if we do reduce the dropout rate, we still know that students are uh, perhaps are just sort of squeaking by to get through high school, but we want them to have a better experience than just squeaking by. So one of the things we do, certainly for inner city children, is we try to get those children to the college campus as young as possible. Almost daily we have third graders, fourth graders, fifth graders, sixth graders, junior high students here on campus and we particularly focus on kids that we think might be at risk. Mm -hmm, so these mm -hmm. are kids that might 
might drop out. We hope they never will. Or if they don't drop out, might sort of be on the edge. Mm -hmm. So we want to tackle the issue of seeing yourself as a college student. We want to start mm -hmm. that very, very young. Mm -hmm. We want little children to think, oh, I could go to Bridgewater State University or any other university. Mm -hmm. That's what it's like on a college campus. So we try to expose them early on, try to make their experiences rich and great, but we also try to partner with schools so that we know what they their teachers need in order to get the students ready for college. That, that sounds like a wonderful combination and I know part of the reason um, that many students who come from lower so socioeconomic uh, experiences is because they have no models, they've never seen a college and so this is wonderful that you're doing this. Um, lots more we could say about that but I think it's great. Plus we have the community colleges now and I That's know right. Bridgewater State University is very connected to uh, Bristol community and Cape Cod community colleges in the state. Um, I remember interviewing um, John Sprague from the community college and at that time it was Dana Molafaria from Bridgewater and Jean um, Oh, last, I lost the name because she's no longer the Chancellor of Dartmouth. McCormick. You, McCormick, yes. thank you, UMass um, Dartmouth. So it was interesting to see how you're all working together. Um, I think I was going to ask you about this just briefly because I, we kind of skirted around this, the testing. I just want to step back for a minute. You want all these children to go to college, but they have to be tested. And there's something new now called, I, not, I've never heard of it before, uh, computer adaptive assessments. Now, how do you adapt a, a test for a certain population, is it? Well, really, this is a beautiful um, aspect of technology. What this attempts to do is maximize precision with testing. Um, a, a young girl I know just told me she's taking the CPA exam, and they use this model. Oh. So here's the thing. She said that, so I said to her, how was the test? And she said it was very difficult. And I said, ugh. And she said, no, that's a good thing. Because if you think it's getting harder, that means you're doing better because they're, you're passing the questions. So they're giving you more challenging questions. You mean as the, ch the student is taking as the test? As you're taking the test. Something is evaluating that? Exactly. So huh. it is, it's really trying to do a precise assessment of where is the student at? So if I ask you a question, I'm going to make some very simple questions, but let's say the question is one plus one. Will you get that right? I know you can add simple, maybe uh, simple addition. So now I ask you 10 plus 10. Now I know you can do two. Did, now I'm not going to jump ahead. At, and let's say you get 10 plus 10 wrong. So now I'm not going to jump ahead to the next question. I'm going to ask you some more questions, maybe 11 plus 11, maybe 11 plus 12. See if, in fact, that was just a fluke. I'm going to wow. really determine what your level is, and then I'm going to build on the questions through the computer technology. How, they can do that with math, but how do you do that? with social studies it's, it's, or it, science, it, it's, it's almost but magical. It's, it's, it is almost magical because technology is so fantastic, wow. but it's really not. Mm -hmm. So let's say, say a ba basic um, sociology, uh, what, was your, what was your example? Science or social or studies. Or let's say a basic science question. Or... So let's say I ask you, what is mitosis? Mm -hmm. And you give me the correct answer. I know, okay, I'm going to go on and ask what is uh, Something related. photosynthesis or what, what have saying. you. Yeah. But if you get it wrong, perhaps I'll ask you now, what is meiosis? Mm -hmm. Or you what is back. cell division? Or, or, or another question mm -hmm. along the same line so that I can really determine, is this person able mm -hmm. to this, ask a, a higher is, level question. Well, you're talking to a reading specialist, so okay. there's, according to Dr. Veach, uh, there's a group of one. In other words, all of what reading is, is so complicated that if you have children in your classroom, they're going to be all over the place, but we no longer talk about, well, they're starting again to talk about personalizing and right, individualizing. Right. So what we're finding is it's not an easy thing to put into a federal law, is it? But this kind of testing, though, does just that. It gives you the it ability, mm -hmm. theoretically anyway, yes. to individualize your instruction and really to chart individual children to really look at their progress now, through time. Now, the, the next step would be to allow teachers to develop programs and have enough money and resource and ILAs or aids in the classroom to make that happen because you know we have to lump so many children together based on this and for a while they were just saying you must teach a scripted lesson to the whole class so 
It's like Mary in a new red dress. I've been around long enough to say, I hope it's coming back again. You give me hope, Dr. Badalino. But now, there's another big controversy, whether it's this federal law, whatever federal law, and that is about the charter schools. Um, people call it a public school, and off air you said it is public, but to, my understanding is they have our funds, federal and state, local funds, but um, maybe you could explain why we can call it public, but not in the way that we might think. All right. So a charter school is a public school. I want you to be clear because people really don't think it is. But it is a public school. It has to follow the same federal regulations that any other school has to follow, any other public school. Uh, the difference is it's privately, or that's the wrong word, independently run. So it can have its, uh, the school can have its own mission its own rules, its own uh, philosophy, and it functions really independently. But it is a public school. It's part of our public school system, in it, not system, but it's part of our public school, um, part of public schools. Yes. It is a component of it. And they receive public money based on how many students they have to run. So the, it, it is a public school and it's a public issue. This isn't no. an issue just for some mm -hmm. people. Um, just on that issue, you said they have public money. But that means the public money for those students that leave the public school goes with that student to the charter school. So what happens to the, the students and the school that's left behind where the funding is already so low and also charter schools can be funded by billionaires, by corporations. They don't have to li be limited to just the public funds that they've just taken out of the public school. That's true. Uh, but public schools also can, if, if there's a millionaire philanthropist, they could receive additional well, funds Well, the word too. there is the, the, the word there that's important is could. Most yes, teachers and principals have so much to, to very do. True. They don't have money to hire a fundraiser. And, and they're so certainly forth. not o operating that way typically. No, they're um, struggling. <laughs> but the issue you point out is the most, is what makes charter schools controversial. The issue is that for charter schools to run, they're based, there's a formula based on how many children, so let's say there's 10 children in this public school, and the public school is the Brown, taking the students from the Brown Elementary School. That town is going to really lose the money that would typically go to those children. I believe it's 90%, or at least 90%. So for school systems that are underfunded, which is almost every school system in the country, there are a few exceptions, but most would claim that they do not receive the funds they need to mm -hmm. do the innovative work we want them mm -hmm. to. That money, to take away more money, and to take away students that are sometimes considered, not always, but sometimes considered the cream of the crop students. Well, at least they have to have transportation. If you have p two parents working and maybe one car, those students are already eliminated. And I know of a nearby town where they, as a charter school waiting to start, and they said they're expecting 300 students, and they haven't even had 100 sign up. So not everybody, they're putting charter schools saying that they're needed. And I agree, I would put the money into the public school, but also, who do they answer to? There's no school board. There's, they don't answer to any oversight. That's a big issue, a, a, a critical issue. So if there's no accountability, we could have complete chaos and very poor quality schools. The plus side or the positive thing to think about charter schools is that they may, and good high quality charter schools could provide a very great option to some students. So every student, this is a hypothetical situation. Let's say uh, we wanted uh, to have a charter school that focused on music education. That was the big emphasis of their school. There are certain kids that would really benefit, really enjoy that and mm -hmm. thrive in that environment, whereas they wouldn't have that opportunity in a typical public school. So well, that for those, but too. those are so few and far between. I have a, a gifted uh, son gifted in music, but he, he was in a public school. He was in the band, he was in the marching band and the orchestra band, and everything else he did that had to do with music. And so if the public school has that uh, opportunity, there's no real reason. It always comes back to why, to me, I, I just think it's such an, a unique American vision that if you come here, you're a citizen, you get an education 
for free because we are all in this together so we want our taxes to take care of you and not for some people to be more privileged or but so it's forth. uniquely American that we would also have this option for a charter school well I don't, I don't know we'd have to talk about that probably on another show because entrepreneurs make money and these are many of them are for-profit schools there are very few and I know I had the president of another organization a teachers organization who said we really don't want people making money on our children and on their education so that's something we have to think about I think it was David Kirk who point. warned us when he wrote about not letting the market um, idea completely you know the tail wagging the dog in public education and I'm so glad that you are here at Bridgewater State University because you are uh, the essence here of public education. So um, in closing, we're getting near the end of our show here. Uh, there are a few um, other points that you feel would be really connected to this new federal law called Every Student Succeeds Act. Is there some other highlight that you'd like to make? Because we just have about less than a minute left. Well, in, just, in less than a minute, I would yeah. say the most important component is maybe even in the title. It is our obligation as teachers, as administrators, just as a United States citizen, it is a resource for us to ensure that every child mm -hmm. does succeed. The goal. Every single child, regardless of disabilities, regardless of socioeconomic background, regardless of religion, mm -hmm. every child that succeeds ends up contributing more to mm -hmm. our society. Mm -hmm. So I think the, that the law is new and updated and improved, hopefully. Mm -hmm. This is something we should embrace that there are kinks to be ironed out, that everything is perfect, it will never mm -hmm. be the case. We'll have to look at the law again in the next 10 years. Sorry to end it right there, but Dr. Badalino, this has been such a stimulating discussion. Thank you. Thank you. And I'll turn to our audience and say we're always looking for what they call best practices. And someone by the name of William Doyle, who is a Fulbright scholar and a New York Times best-selling author, he went to Finland, and we hear that Finland is uh, kind of the most world-renowned great school. So I'm going to quote him in part in what he found. He said, unlike in many other nations, children in Finland are given a rich, wide curriculum, a highly professionalized teacher force with freedom and autonomy, while much of the rest of the world is flooding schools with counterproductive stress, privatization, and low-quality standardized testing. Finland leads the world with its evidence-based, child-centered approach, end quote. I've heard many teachers and professors talk about evidence-based, child-centered approaches here in America. And so I hope that as this new law develops, that they will be listening to those voices of the teachers who understand the very things that Finland is doing. And I know I'm hoping that teachers have a loud voice as they engage in their school talk.